great concept. Keep it up. I think uh, it has tremendous potential to do to do this. Okay. Thank you for having me. To the unknown God, uh, I think for most of us here, he's not unknown at all, is he? He personally reached out to us in our sin, sent his son, his eternal son, into his creation to die on the cross for our sins. And so that is the God that we proclaim, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the broader question is, why is there suffering and death in the world at all? And this is a challenge that's often made to, to believers. Uh, if you believe in a loving, all-powerful God, why is there the level of suffering and death that goes on in the world? Is that a good question? Absolutely. We live in a broken world, don't we? And, uh, and so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So... That's the God I'm going to proclaim to you, the one that most of us know tonight as our Lord and Saviour. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So why did Jesus have to suffer and die for our sins? Why is there suffering and death in the world? It's called the theodicy. It's defending the goodness of God in the face of a world of suffering and death. People like Richard Attenborough, have, uh, uh, David Attenborough, um, he looks at a, a particular example of a parasite worm that can live only in the eyeball and leads to blindness and tremendous suffering. And he says, what kind of God would do that? And as far as I can see, there's only three possible answers to that challenge of suffering and death. The first possible answer is that, well, maybe... David Attenborough is right, and there is no God. I'm not saying that is the answer, but it's one of the three possible answers to that question of suffering and death. We can just conclude, well, there, there cannot be a God. But if we do that, we also get rid of the argument against suffering and death. It's just the way things are. Survival of the fittest, random processes, that's just the way things are. And so there is no argument against suffering, physical suffering of animals or people if there is no God. The second possibility, and, and this is believed by most Christian pastors and leaders today, they believe in the Big Bang, they believe the universe is 13.7 billion years old, they believe the earth is 4.5 billion years old, and they believe in some uh, form of this process of life developing over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, beginning with a simple so-called single-celled organism, and then evolving over hundreds of millions of years of death, suffering, cancer, carnivory, and becoming more and more complex creatures with man right at the end of that process. In other words, if you're a believer and you accept the billions of years dating the age of the earth and of the universe, it means that you believe that God basically made the world like that. Death and suffering is actually the creative process that led to mankind. I don't serve a God like that, but that is the second option. If you believe in billions of years, it means that by the time God had created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, he looked at that finished creation and he said, it is very good. But if that billions of years interpretation of the geological column is true, it means that by the time God had finished creating, he was looking at a world, at a Garden of Eden, sitting on a record of millions and millions of years of death, suffering, cancer, carnivory, and God said, it is very good. None of us believe that suffering and death is very good, and neither does God. But that is the implication if a believer accepts the billions of years dating. It's just the way God made the universe. Hundreds of millions of years of suffering and death of animals and of humans. 
And a lot of that idea is based on radioisotope dating and the decay of certain isotopes to other isotopes. Um, uh, uh, carbon-14 to nitrogen-14, rubidium to strontium, potassium to argon, argon to argon. There's many, many of these decay processes that go on in the rocks. Do you know that there are many of those processes that support the biblical chronogenealogies of just a few thousand years? Many of them. There are some of them that also that seem to support these deep time interpretations of millions or billions of years. But all of these processes, whether they seem to support the Bible or support the Big Bang, are based on this set of principles. I'm going to test your maths. Let's say you walk into a bathroom. Go back again. You walk into a bathroom, open the door, and you immediately see that there's 100 liters of water in the bathtub, and the tap is running at 10 liters per minute. How long has that process been going on for? 10 minutes. I oh, hear. Yeah. Excellent. Your maths is correct. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But let's ask ourselves a question. What assumptions did you use in order to arrive at that result? Firstly, was the bathtub half empty or half full, depending on your personality, when that process started? You see, the point is you were not there. You can only see these, pro these processes in the present, and you make an assumption about the past in order to arrive at your result. Was water removed or added during that process? You don't know. You weren't there. Did the flow rate increase or decrease, or was it even turned off? You don't know. You weren't there. It's based upon you are not there in the past. So you can only observe these processes in the present. And based on your assumptions about the past, you then arrive at a result. Every single one of your dating methods are based on those kinds of assumptions about the past that are unobservable, untestable, cannot be repeated, cannot be experimented upon. And so, for somebody to believe in the billions of years, you do it by faith. Faith in philosophical naturalism, faith in these assumptions, faith in secular scientists. Do not believe that it is based on experimental science. It is not. The third possible... Well, if that interpretation of the geological column is true. It means that suffering and death has existed for hundreds of millions of years. Which means that suffering and death is not the result of sin. Why then did Jesus have to suffer and die on the cross? It doesn't make sense. And so that brings us to the third possible answer to that problem of suffering and death. And Paul answered that question. He said, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death, suffering, through sin. So according to Paul, what came first? Death or sin? Sin came first, and death followed. Adam's sin came first, and death followed. And we referred to this passage earlier, where God created a perfect universe, a perfect earth in six days and on day six when he had finished creating, he looked at his finished creation and he said, it is very good. Very good. He gave a herbivorous diet to the animals and a vegetarian diet to Adam and Eve. But, and he said to Adam, enjoy, go wild. But as a, as a made in the image of God, as a creature made in the image of God, God gave Adam one restriction, to not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. That was the warning that God gave to Adam. That is where suffering and death began. And that is why Jesus had to die, suffer and die on the cross for my sins in order to take the penalty for sin upon himself. 
That's why he suffered and died. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Little plug, a ministry that I've been involved in as a volunteer and part-time speaker for decades, uh, Creation Ministries International. Creation.com is our website and a wonderful, wonderful resource to answer these and many, many more questions you might have. But just a reminder, God considers suffering and death an enemy to be destroyed. If we believe in billions of years, God just created the earth like that, with suffering and death of, on an unimaginable scale. But that's not what he did. He created a perfect, perfect universe without suffering, without death. Suffering and death intruded because of man's sin. And that is why each of us, if we lose a loved one or even a loved pet, our hearts tell us there's something wrong, don't they? Yeah. It's not meant to be that way. And God agrees with us. He calls suffering and death the last enemy to be destroyed. And come Lord Jesus, I'm looking forward to that day. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.